so it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters, and I'm going to say just a few words about the presentations, and then you'll hear a lot more from them. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the crew um, for the Institute on College Futures Online um, now, and then we'll just roll organically um, from one to the other. So um, Bob Elder, Jedediah Rex, Edward Finn, and um, Rachel Van Kampenhoot are presenting on the Institute on College Futures Online resource. And again, I love two things about this, and I'll love more by the end of the presentation. But this project um, took what was an original institute in person on um, college futures uh, put together by ACM. And what I love about the original project is that the, the association, the consortium, aimed to do for college faculty and staff what is very hard to do at a local institution, which is to get a critical mass of folks aware of the economics um, what, what the drivers are in terms of revenue and expense to keep an institution operating and sustained into, into the future. So I love that that was a consortial approach. And then obviously the second thing that there was this access mission, not everyone can go to this program in person. And so partnering to create an online version of this program in some form so that all of us can go and um, gain some of the knowledge that, that came through the the full-on program. So um, Bob teaches macroeconomics, money and banking, and game theory, among other things, at Beloit. I'm very interested to learn more about his work applying game theory to the operations of liberal arts <laughs> colleges. I think that would be fascinating. Um, he, um, he has taught in Poland and Latvia on Ful Fulbright lectureships and in an international MBA program in Finland, which sounds like a lot of fun. If you um, have a bracket during basketball season, ask him about dominatrix. Right? Um, Jedediah manages the instructional technology group at Beloit, assisting faculty and students um, with finding and using innovative technology resources for their teaching and learning, including a digital media toolbox that he has created, which I thought was very cool uh, for the community. Um, Edward is the liaison for technology and teaching and learning at ACM. Um, and he also teaches at IUPUI and Indiana Wesleyan. Um, his doctoral work focus, focused on organizational leadership, and this I thought was so interesting, faculty perceptions of organizational change and, and how it's led, um, and he blogs about technology in the liberal arts. And Rachel is learning content manager at Acrobatic and um, key partner on the online program that we'll be learning about. She has a, a, a rich background in English, writing, publishing, and philosophy and is working on her ed D in instructional technology and leadership at Duquesne. So thank you all for being here, and we'll turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. My name's Ed Finn. Uh, I was going to introduce myself and my group, but it was such a wonderful introduction at the beginning, I don't need to. So um, what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about the Institute on College Futures Online. So we're going to look at what got us here, and that's my role, is to talk about that, talk about where we started and where we ended and where we're going to go from here, because it's actually going to be an ongoing process moving forward. Um, then Bob will talk about the content. Uh, he was one of the four subject matter experts involved in the project. Uh, then Jedediah will talk about the design process, and uh, Rachel will come in and talk about the platform. Um, and I'll show you the team that was involved in putting this together as we go through my piece of it, since I'm doing the history and kind of the process. But I did want you to get the overall of where we're going to be. All right, so that did work. So what did get us here? So one thing I want to do is, if you'll indulge me, show a little 90-second video that gives you an idea of what ICF is all about. It's playing, but it's not coming through. And we'll talk through it. Um, what it is is, this is Jill Tiefenthaler. She's the president of Colorado College. She was one of the original four people who presented at the uh, Institute on College Futures, which was the basis for the ICF Online. Institute on College Futures uh, talked about um, the financial model of the small liberal arts college. So it talked about discount rate. It talked about, um, Bob will talk a little bit more about his content and some of the pieces that involves game theory and why we discount rate and why we do things like that. Um, it talked about, um, tuition in general, it talked about uh, deferred expenses, it talked about all the things that go into running a college. 
uh, that really faculty don't get uh, coming into that environment. So it was uh, funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation, uh, and they said, well, let's do some in-person seminars about this. Let's do this uh, each summer. Uh, we managed to reach, uh, by the end of this summer, we've got one coming up next month, 250 faculty members on our campuses, which is around 10% of the total. And then, uh, it's held in Chicago every, uh, every year. Uh, it talks about all these different types of things. Well, then we started talking about, well, how do we encapsulate that? These faculty members have come to see it. And they're pretty excited about it. Uh, and so the Teagle Foundation came in and said, well, let's boil down these hour and a half, hour and a half presentations, one of which Jill did, into five minutes. <laughs> and so I was tasked, you know, both fortunately and unfortunately, with watching them all because I was brand new to ACM in like two days. And I knew nothing about the Small Liberal Arts College. And my boss said, read watch these as if you know nothing. I said, great, I can do that. <laughs> I'm good at that because I know nothing. Yes. Um, and so I was part of the people who whittled that down a little bit as to what the takeaways were. Um, and then, of course, the experts did that too. Jill you know, reviewed it. Um, and, and so did uh, Michael uh, Orr from Lake Forest, uh, David Whedon um, from McAllister, and Scott Beerman, which is a boy. So, um, Okay, so when we talked a little bit about this, uh, I didn't jump ahead. Uh, but a couple of things I missed. Endowment management is a big component of this. A lot of people don't understand how the endowment draw is, is done um, and how that feeds into the operating budget uh, and overall financial literacy. And then we did the, the, the summary video presentations. So then we were running out of funding for the in-person institutes that were actually supposed to end right. next year, or last year, not next year, last year, but we scraped up enough to do it again this year. Um, but we said, what are we going to do after this? What's sustainable out of this model? Mm -hmm. We've managed to educate faculty members on the campuses. We've managed to do some really cool things. Mm -hmm. But what are we going to do moving forward? So uh, Brian Williams, who's my boss, and uh, we pitched to the Teagle Foundation. Mm -hmm. What if we moved this online? What if we did something a little bit different and we tried to come up with a way to make this sustainable in the long term? And in the same time, filling that gap in knowledge, but expanding it to staff. So now not only faculty are able to attend, but have a professional development opportunity for the staff. Um, who may be struggling with the same thing, coming in from different backgrounds and not really having uh, that back, that knowledge of the Small Little or Arts College. Now, what's really cool about this, and we'll talk about the process, is we managed to get all four of the original colleges to participate in the process. Now, we did not get the two presidents. They're pretty busy, so we did not do that. But they gave us two really good economists to help guide that piece. And Bob being one of those from Beloit, mm -hmm. and Dan Johnson from Colorado being the other economist. Uh, Michael Orr, who's the dean of Lake Forest College, and uh, David Wheaton, who is the C uh, chief financial officer at McAllister College, came in to serve as subject matter experts for their two modules. So we thought, well, how can we do this? What's a good way to present this? Uh, we looked at some different models for some different software packages. Uh, we talked to various uh, Games Foundation uh, recipients. Mm -hmm. And uh, we settled to work with Rachel and her team in Acrobatic. Um, Acrobatic has the potential to be, a, it's an adaptive learning platform, so there's a lot we can do in that. But it's based on good learning science. And I'll let her talk more about what the actual platform does uh, when, when we get there. But the idea of developing skills and outcomes and really being purposeful in how we design the course was at the heart of this. So what we did was we built a team, uh, partially through discussions at the ACM, but also with the steering committee, which were the original presenters. We said, what should this team look like? What is a way that we can make sure we get everybody heard? We can get all the material in. We can make sure that it's done the right way the first time. Or right as it can be, it's going to change, but at least to be on the right path. 
So uh, on my on the ACM end, you had me, uh, which uh, in my role I traveled all 14 schools, so I know a lot of the people on the campuses, and we have conversations about different technologies. And Brian Williams, who's my boss, who's faculty development and grants. At Beloit, uh, you had Bob and Jedediah, and what we did was pair a technologist with a content expert, so that there was plenty of support not only from our end at ACM, not only from Acrobatic, but on the campus for each, uh, each team. Colorado College was Dan Johnson and Jennifer Bill Lightly. Lake Forest was uh, Michael Lohr and uh, Connie Corso, and then McAllister was David Wheaton and Brad Belvis. And then at Acrobatic, we had Rachel and Murray Kimball, who was kind of the, the project manager who kind of really helped me stay between the lines mm -hmm. sometimes, because we were, we had a lot of moving parts. So now let's talk about the process real quick. And again, I'm not going to get into the weeds on the platform because that will come later, but what we started with was a meeting in Chicago. So we brought everybody into Chicago uh, and we sat in a room for eight hours, maybe a little over eight hours, <laughs> uh, on a Saturday. and. We had done some pre-work. We had had all of the content experts come up with competencies and learning outcomes so that we could hit the ground running when we got there. Uh, we did that, uh, and then once we refined those, we discussed them, we came up with what we were sure were going to be for the four modules, all the different outcomes and uh, competencies. Then we went back and did the skill development. Uh, what was really cool about that process was the technologists and the faculty and uh, all of us just having an acrobatic Skype in. I mean, we had a really robust discussion about levels of knowing and what we thought was possible within this context. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't go too far, buy off more than we can chew, but still do something that we could be proud of. So then we went on to the development phase, which was actually taking some of the existing content, including those five minute videos, but also writing more content. And we'll let Bob talk about his, but the idea was to give each of the four uh, speakers a voice. So they presented content in different ways. Uh, these included uh, screencasts, narrative, uh, videos that were parsed, a lot of different uh, so we developed the content, developed different activity types and different questions uh, with some really targeted feedback. Um, then we did a peer review. Everyone looked at everyone else's module and provided feedback on the different modules, even if they weren't responsible for writing content for that. And then we did the pilot. And the pilot, we learned a ton from. So the pilot was great. We took 20 uh, original uh, face-to-face -face members of ICF came back and took this for us so that they could look at how it compared to their experience and going through the face-to-face -face version. And then we took five new, or I take, invert that, 20 new, five original. So five original members came back and then we had 20 newbies who didn't really know what they were signing up for, but I gave them a nice little Amazon gift card and they said thank you and I said thank you. And they gave a lot of really good feedback. It allowed us to refine the, the question feedback. It allowed us to refine the types of questions that were being asked. It allowed us to look at some of the technical glitches that happen when you have a lot of video and multimedia going into a, a course. And then the last piece of this is the sustainability piece. Uh, what are we going to do after the Tegel money comes out? Well, we built in a model uh, to refresh this every two years. The first two years is paid for by Teagle, so in about 18 months now, we're going to refresh the content and we'll update some things based on feedback that's still ongoing uh, through a survey. Um, and then after that, it does have the ACM members get it for free, and then there's a small fee for others. We're hoping to subsidize the refresh. Now, we know that that may or may not happen. But so far, five external institutions are already enrolling people in it. So it's, uh, it seems to be pretty popular. Um, and the participant evaluations are very important. I basically just chopped off the piece that asked, were you a previous ICF member? And we kept a robust survey down to the learning outcome level and the question level, having them rank questions, having them uh, talk about individual learning outcomes and whether they felt they were met. Um, their 
confidence in talking about the topic with their peers. Uh, so a pretty robust survey to capture as much information as we can, along with, and I think I'll go back to them, the analytics that the adaptive platform provides, um, which shows way beyond just time in the system, matches in the learning goals and, and different things. I don't let me steal Rachel's thunder. She's given me the, the look that I'm going to do it. And one piece that I did not uh, really talk about, I said the acrobatic team, but there was a whole team there of learning engineers. And their learning engineers are more than just um, tech support. They really are technologists that know about learning design. So that was a very integral part of the whole team coming together. So what I'm going to do now is hand this over to Bob. And he's going to talk a little bit about the content, and then we'll go from there. That's the thing. I forgot. Okay. <laughs> well, um, if we proceed from the assumption that a general model of blended learning includes a traditional classroom component, and then an online uh, piece that students can self-regulate with regard to both their preferred pace and their preferred path, then our version of, of this uh, has as the, um, uh, in, in general, we've got four modules, uh, and each of the four modules has uh, a classroom component and then the online piece that students can control the pace and path for. So um, Jill Tiefenthaler of Colorado College uh, gave talks at the Institute for College Futures. Uh, uh, there's the five minute video version. There's also the complete version, I think, that you can access on, online at the ACM website. Right, right, we have the full speeches. That's right, so there's the, the our version of the tr traditional classroom. You watch the, the video of her talk. And then uh, Dan Johnson comes along and provides the online content. That the student can travel through uh, at their preferred pace and choosing their, their preferred path as well. Uh, in that sense, uh, um, Dan uh, from Colorado College, uh, as he pairs with Jill Tiefenthaler, the Colorado College president. And then uh, here's Scott Bierman, who gave a talk. You can watch the full thing at the ACM website or the six minute version. That's the traditional classroom. And then I come along and provide the online content. Uh, and um, when Ann was describing how Dan and I came in, uh, it may have sounded as if we were substitutes for uh, Jill and Scott, respectively, but really in our roles and in the spirit of blended learning, uh, we're complements. Uh, so our online content is a complement with uh, their presentations, their traditional classroom work. And uh, indeed, as, as I wrote up my part, um, uh, I had been to one of the ICF uh, summer sessions, so I'd seen Scott present live. Uh, I went uh, to the ACM website and watched the video again, and then uh, basically took my uh, task as writing up a companion piece uh, to his classroom presentation. And so you can think of this as a, a chapter, a textbook chapter that, that a student would read at home uh, while um, reviewing their notes from class. Um, so uh, there again, it's a complementary relationship. And there are intra-module complementarities, such as this content with Scott Bierman's presentation. But as we're also going to note, there are inter-module com complementarities, too. I think of intra-module complementarities as sort of vertical relationships. But then students can move horizontally if they choose their path through the four modules. And there need to be complementaries horizontally across those four modules as well. Uh, and that's a fine line to walk as, as we're going to see. Uh, 
just uh, uh, to take you to the third module, Michael Ward is the provost at Lake Forest College, and uh, he also provided the online content uh, for module three. Similarly, David Wheaton is the chief financial officer at McAllister College, and David also provided his own complimentary content for the online component. Uh, so what I'm going to focus on is, is uh, the part that I did, uh, the narrative component for Module 2, the companion to, to Scott Bierman's classroom presentation. And uh, as I got underway, uh, our module is on the, the tuition-driven college's dilemma. And uh, just to put things in the full perspective, uh, I actually started with reference to a school like Harvard or uh, some very uh, wealthy liberal arts colleges that actually need not charge tuition if, if they uh, uh, some expenses. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. And, and uh, um, so um, uh, they could finance operations uh, from the uh, draw from endowment. Mm -hmm. And so um, I needed to talk about uh, rules governing the endowment draw. And there's this concept of intergenerational equity, which Michael Orr actually discusses in, in module three. Uh, just generally, your endowment's going to earn some rate of return like 7%. Uh, a draw of, say, 5% will preserve intergenerational equity uh, because after that, the endowment grows by 2%, which is about the inflation rate. So the real purchasing power of the endowment is preserved over time, and intergeneral, intergenerational equity is preserved. So... When I uh, first wrote up my uh, narrative piece here in Module 2, um, I uh, talked about intergenerational equity and I explicitly referenced Module 3 and the fact that Michael Orr also discusses this there. And we got some feedback in the uh, pilot uh, uh, version of this that, that in which students actually said, um, uh, when I read this uh, reference to Module 3, as I was going through Module 2, I paused and asked myself, am I choosing the right path? Should I stop now and go read Module 3 and then come back to Module 2? And again, in, in blended learning, you want the student to have control over uh, the on-site component and how you travel through it. Uh, and therefore, I needed to achieve two things. The complementarity across modules, uh, they needed to fit together nicely uh, and work as a team, but we didn't want to disrupt any path that a student might be choosing and cause them to doubt whether they were taking the optimal path. And so I removed the explicit references to Module 3 from uh, Michael Orr, but I kept the discussion of intergenerational equity intact um, and uh, said everything I wanted to say and left it to the student to hopefully make those connections uh, on their own as they followed their path. Um, another nice compliment, uh, and Jedediah and, and Rachel uh, may be talking about this, is the uh, companion glossary to our narrative text. You'll see some uh, terms highlighted in green, and any uh, term highlighted in green that you click on will take you to a glossary uh, where uh, further definitions are provided, okay? And uh, we uh, do use uh, some game theory in um, this module. Um, uh, Scott Bierman, before he came to Boyd College, was at Carleton College, where he actually taught a course in game theory and uh, co-authored a textbook on game theory. Uh, and I'm currently the prof at Beloit College that, that teaches our game theory course. So uh, module two is, is really a couple of game theorists. And, and so we do um, uh, define terms like Nash equilibrium. Uh, and uh, uh, it's something that one can do here in the narrative 
part of our module that, as Scott, in fact, did not pause to do in that mm -hmm. hour and 15 minutes or so that he spoke. Uh, that was a, sort of a luxury he couldn't afford, going into the details of game theory. So here in this sort of textbook companion, I have that luxury, and so I do go into it. Um, and uh, uh, Scott sets up a, a prisoner's dilemma game. Uh, and the title of this module, the tuition-driven college's mm -hmm. dilemma, mm -hmm. is a variation on the prisoner's dilemma. And we're not implying that tuition-driven colleges are prisoners. <laughs> but, but, uh, yeah. Let's just say we're tuition-driven. <laughs> uh, so um, again, Scott outlines uh, the broad parameters of the prisoner's dilemma game. Uh, Basically, uh, the choices of two colleges are to offer merit aid or not to offer merit aid. Uh, and um, uh, as in any prisoner's dilemma game, um, uh, the Nash equilibrium occurs where both players defect. And uh, defection in this case is offering merit aid. Uh, it's sort of the, the choice to uh, uh, choose the more aggressive price competition uh, as you um, uh, compete for students with, with your uh, peer institutions. Um, so um, again, ideas like uh, defection and cooperation I can go into in, in further detail here in this narrative and uh, on the subject of cooperating between colleges uh, well, um, defection is the dominant strategy, again, a little bit more game theory. Um, but um, uh, if you're going to um, uh, try to avoid sort of the Pareto-dominated uh, Nash equilibrium, which is for both colleges to defect, uh, cooperation is problematic as well because you run the risk of violating the Sherman Act of 1890. Uh, you, uh, you run the risk of violating the antitrust laws. Uh, and um, the antitrust laws are designed to protect the consumer, in this case, the student. Uh, so uh, the antitrust uh, authorities want us to uh, pursue that most aggressive form of price uh, competition, even though it means that we're kind of defecting vis-a-vis -vis each other. Um, there again, this is something that you can include in a sort of a textbook companion uh, uh, that you can't include in an hour and 15 minute lecture. And, and uh, Scott doesn't talk about the Sherman Act of 1890, I don't think, in, in his uh, presentation. Um, uh, finally, uh, I have a, a sort of a, an Excel file, which is a, just sort of a more detailed version of an Excel file that David Wheaton presents in his module four. Um, I designed my sort of modified version of, of his uh, Wheaton model to work in the context of uh, module two uh, uh, on uh, the tuition-driven college's dilemma. Uh, college A uh, has an endowment of about $390 million, college B uh, and down to about $190 million. And uh, the general idea is that if you're the less wealthy school, then you look for avenues of non-price competition that allow you to distinguish yourself in the marketplace mm -hmm. so that uh, students choose you for particular reasons that you provide. And this enables you actually to lower your discount rate. Mm -hmm. and get more net tuition, which is what you're depending on if, if you don't have that large endowment like college A. Um, now, again, the first time I did this, I explicitly referenced uh, uh, module four uh, and the fact that Wheaton was going to be presenting an Excel document too. Uh, and there again, uh, the feedback was the students paused at th that moment and, and questioned whether they were taking the right path. Uh, and, uh, so I wanted to keep the content, which we did, um, but I removed the sort of explicit uh, references to the future module 
so that students could feel good about the path that they were on and just sort of keep on going on impeding. So um, uh, in the end, uh, uh, hopefully the complementarities come through once more because in, in his presentation, Wheaton doesn't talk about economic concepts such as the fact that a surplus or a deficit is a flow and uh, an endowment is a stock. If you run a surplus, uh, that flow adds to the stock of endowment. If you run a deficit, that flow subtracts from the stock of endowment. Uh, again, these are extra uh, complementary points that you can make in a, in a uh, textbook companion that the teacher can't necessarily uh, always present in, in the confines of a classroom lecture. So I think that uh, uh, brings us to uh, part three of today's presentation, and, and hopefully uh, we're complimenting each other <laughs> as we go along here today as well. Uh, the essence of blended learning is that whatever is being blended works together as complements, yes. and uh, that's the spirit of, of this presentation here today as well. Sure. So, so my role uh, in this project was to help with the um, the nuts and bolts of getting content from from Bob into the Acrobatic platform. Um, and one thing that I want to point out first that I really appreciate about the platform. Um, and the focus that it brings is on the learning objectives. The teacher in me loves this um, because it puts the focus where it needs to be. Um, the learning objectives are visible to everyone that accesses the course. So um, the, in the design process, we, we worked off of the learning objectives and then the students says they come to the courses, they see these so they know what, what the big ideas are. Um, and then based on the learning objectives, there were also skills that the content experts created. Um, those are not visible to students as they go through, um, but they were helpful to the design team as they created everything so that we know what the students are doing. Um, and this is an example of the learning objectives on the page. Uh, we've seen some of this already in Bob's slides. I um, just wanted to draw it out. Um, so that, you know, this is an example of the students come to the page, they know, okay, these are the things that, that I'm going to be working on. Um, and this is a call out to the glossary terms that Bob mentioned. Um, and then we'll keep moving on. So the other, the other piece um, that I appreciate about this uh, is the targeted feedback. So this is an example of uh, the WYSIWYG editor um, that is familiar if you word process, word process at all, uh, you'll be familiar with this. Um, but it it allows you to add targeted feedback, and I think Bob really took this to heart um, as as he was going through this process. Um, and the other the other part of this. Um, and this is, well, in the next slide, we'll see an example of this, but um, one of the parts of this was infusing Bob's personality and teaching style into the platform, part of which is um, Bob likes a lot of color um, and does an awesome chalk and talk um, and, and uses colors within that. And it's really hard to see on the screen, but if you look at the term endowment um, and here with surplus and deficit, there's different colors. Um, I think those are the only three that we have on this page. Uh, but then there, there was um, a table uh, that also has colors, and these colors reference different points in the text. So the idea is that the colors help the students form connections between different things. Um, I have to tap tip my hat, not tap my head, um, <laughs> <laughs> to Acrobatic in this because we had a heck of a time getting this to bathe. <laughs> um, 
and we were able to work with them and the developers to turn on a beta WYSIWYG editor for us to get this to work. Uh, so, uh, and I think, here we are, to talk about Acrobatic itself. I'm Rachel, I'm here from Acrobatic, the uh, platform end of this, uh, this process. Um, I just want to start, for those of you who are unfamiliar with us, which is probably all of you, um, we actually came out of Carnegie Mellon University, um, where you know, they took all of the basic features, they, they spun up OLI, I don't know, 13 years ago, 14, something like that. Um, where you know all of the applied research, the learning science came from, and it was from OLI that uh, Acrobatic was formed. Uh, we are a startup um, that that came out of all of that research. So we, as a company, are um, entrenched in that research. We care about you know the learning science. We care about the methodology. We we care about how we do design of courseware of content. The learning model, all of these things um, are, are really critical to, to who we are. Um, and I think, you know, I, I'll go through it and talk about how that kind of intersects with this project that, you know, that these guys put together. Um, Smart Author is um, our authoring and data analytics tool. We've built kind of a user friendly interface to building out course content. So, you know, you don't you don't need to have anybody who's doing any any coding. You don't need need any of that. You know, you've you've got Jen Dye and you've got Bob, and they're able to create incredibly, you know, fantastic looking content. Um, you know, all on their own with Smart Author. So here you can see this is just um, what the back end of Smart Author looks like. Um, and so when you're on a page, you just click add add a section here, and then it gives you a pop up, and you can choose do I want body content. Uh, the second one down here is actually that, uh, oh, there it is, uh, this, uh, beta, this beta section that, that we were talking about where um, we needed to work with them. They had requirements in, in order to best showcase the content that we didn't support at the time. So, you know, we got those requirements and we, you know, put a feature in and we, we tested out, a, you know, a new beta content, you know, section. Um, all of our formative activities, we've got videos, tables, excerpts, call-outs, so, you know, you choose, you choose what you want in here, and then off you go. So, learning science is, is key to us in our courses, um, and I think it was, it's pretty evident that these guys took that to heart. Um, you know, like Jen and I was saying, the learning objectives um, and the skill map is the architectural structure behind a course. So once you've decided what those are, you know, and you build your content um, with those learning objectives, those get tied into our formative practice. And our formative practice appear on content pages. Students should be practicing what they're learning, chunked appropriately, right? So it's all about our design process. So, um, you know, we, we know that more doing has six times the effect size on learning than more reading. Um, and formative practice is what drives our analytics engine. So, you know, you've got this, this intersection between um, our skill map, the learning objectives and skills that, you know, students are being assessed on in the formatives, and what that feeds into our analytics engine. Um, we also know that over 98% of students answer formative questions until we get them correct. Um, and targeted feedback is, um, is really important to us. Uh, you know, if you answer and you just get a correct or incorrect, that's not a learning opportunity. And, um, you know, we, we want to generate those learning opportunities through feedback, which is what instructors often do in person when they're teaching in class. So trying to capture those moments of, you know, okay, there's, there's a common misconception here, or there's a frequent error that students make if they select the incorrect choice. You know, what can we teach them to get them to, you know, Reevaluate their, you know, their answer and, and choose correct the next time around. All of that learning, uh, you know, learning data that's generated by these formatives 
um, can be viewed here in the learning dashboard. So when you know when these guys want to take a look at how people are performing, they can they can jump into their dashboard and see how well are students learning. This particular one um, is this graph that 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 is up is looking at one learning objective from you know one point in the course, and you've got participation along the bottom, but you've got their learning estimates, which is what our analytics does up here. And this gives you a much more um, multi-dimensional look at. Um, you know, how, how students are performing. So, you know, it may not be something where they're going to go to a faculty member for this course and say, oh, you know, you're not doing so well, you know, that's probably not happening here, but if you have a biology course um, with a small cohort and you want to say, okay, this student down here at the bottom, they're moving along, they're almost halfway through the practice and they're still performing poorly. Maybe there's an intervention there. Uh, so, uh, the data that you see here can also inform iterative improvement, uh, which is something that, you know, like these guys have also taken a hard, like a two-year improvement cycle. Of course, some of that is for content, right? Economics and higher ed, that's going to be changing slowly over the years, and there's new factors involved. So, a content refresh is probably necessary for this type of course. But also, um, you can do a lot of other things with the platform and um, incorporating survey you know, data from people who have taken their course. They want to see more of this type of activity. We can also take a look, given all of this, this data we've collected, and say, actually, we probably should add some more practice here. Um, it seems like this is a really good spot. Um, in addition to things like this is a, a readiness report that uh, we have on our end that will kind of give you a breakdown of different sections, skill map, accessibility, um, all those kinds of things. And you can use this as a tool to look at your course structure from the, you know, the nitty gritty back end, either before delivering your course or to do an iterative improvement cycle. Let's, let's write a report, let's see what there is, let's do some tweaking and see how it goes the next time around, um, which is also pretty important to us and, and you know, great that um, you know, it's kind of built into this, this uh, project here. And that is it for me. Um, I know we're, we're just on time now. You're doing great. I'm curious what the, you said, small fee to subsidize the um, revision. To take the course as an individual, it's $125. And it takes about four hours, give or take, to complete. We designed it to keep it short. Um, campuses can purchase anything over 100 seats. Um, for a discount of $100 each. Mm -hmm. So if they want to buy some ahead, they're good for ever. So if you, if you buy them, then you can use them three years from now. Mm -hmm. If you want to know anything about it, if you go to acm.edu slash ICF online, all one word, mm -hmm. you can read about the design process, you can see how to purchase it. I think it, I already found it on that. Canvas. Yeah, well, in the Canvas site, which I didn't mention during the presentation, um, is kind of a companion so that you can see some of the stuff mm -hmm. that's in the course yeah, um, mm -hmm. but if and it's also there to facilitate discussion mm -hmm. um, Bob made a very good point about this being a supplement and what we encourage campuses to do they don't have to they can send somebody through one at a time mm -hmm. but we encourage them to do a cohort model and then have a follow-up discussion yeah. um, just because that's what Lake Forest who was one of the content campuses that's how they chose to use it for new faculty was to have them go through, take the course, and then have a discussion about the topics that were covered, mm -hmm. um, just so you still get that that touch mm -hmm. um, and can get that questions answered that you might not get mm -hmm. or that you might still have. So the classroom aspect of it, it's still all uh, videos are available for that? It's all online. Yes, okay, so all the videos. Uh, the only thing, well, and in the Canvas site, uh, Module 4 has screencasts that walk you through the budget sheet. Um, so we, we talked about the individual personalities coming through, and uh, David Wheaton is a talker and a shower. He, he doesn't like to write narrative. And so we finally said, let him talk it. And we, Brad Belvis and McAllister had him uh, capture it uh, and then added in some really cool animations to draw it out. Make it really his, and so that's that's one of the cool things about the project. I think. I think if you go to the ACM web website, uh, you can watch the the full hour long uh, lectures uh, for free mm -hmm. uh, right now. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. And Canvas is the Canvas site is free too. So there's no charge for that to sign up. I, I was wondering about assessment. In the beginning, somebody said that that so much of this faculty don't get. Mm -hmm. And how does the getting actually get measured? Is it something about what happens in curricular mm -hmm. revision processes? Is it about personnel issues? Does Stop something else happen on <laughs> campus? <laughs> that would reflect that understanding that you're seeking? Well, and, and anybody else can jump in here too, uh, but I think a lot of it has to do that faculty members are, are asked to be on committees and they're right. asked to deal with financial issues. Um, so, and this material isn't covered as you're becoming a faculty member. So, for the most part, and especially if you come from a large R1 or, or some kind of an environment where you're not tuition driven necessarily because of state appropriations and you don't have a large endowment. So understanding how all that interplays, I, I, but as far as our assessment, um, and, and Bob can speak to this probably more so than me, but we, the, the content experts wanted it to feel like a seminar. They didn't want to test people. And, and you know, that's not the role. The role was to use the formative um, components. Wouldn't you agree, Bob? Yeah, I mean, there are problem sets. And as uh, Rachel was talking about, you can um, choose an answer and uh, a pop-up will tell you not only whether it's correct, but why it's correct in some further detail, or, or if it's incorrect, uh, why it's incorrect, and then, again, further detail. And, and sometimes uh, I, I think it's good for a student to, to try to get it correct, but then to read the, the explanations for some of the incorrect answers because in, in di discussing why it's incorrect, you learn a little bit more. Oh, yeah. um, and um, uh, so the problem sets are there. Uh, also, with regard to another of your points, uh, at Lloyd College, we have an academic strategic planning committee. And uh, our dean in selecting faculty to attend the ICF conferences each summer has simply chosen faculty who are on that committee. Okay, I can just follow directly up on that, but it, it's still not clear to me. Okay, if, if you make me go to the conference, I'll, I'll absorb the content. But if you tell me, hey, you've just been appointed to this committee and this is a terrific resource, my answer is thanks, but I've got a lot of other things to do. So it's not just a matter of making it free for me. It's making, creating a, a real incentive for me to, to do it. You know, I'm saying, are you going to say that, that you're not allowed to make a comment in a faculty meeting if you haven't seen the particular course here? Obviously, that doesn't work. <laughs> Trying to get our faculty to understand fishing, right? Which, which we have PhD people all over the place, and we still, again and again, click the button and say, oh, this is terrific. And, and, and um, you know, it's a wonderful presentation, but our faculty won't look at it, right? So, I, you know, it, it, it's build it and they will come, they won't come. And I'm back on the assessment side, right? I think assessing that they've gotten, that mastered the problem set is great, but how do you measure the fact that you have had any kind of, not you, because it's terrific, no, no, no. but, but that, that, the, that the project has succeeded in, in changing the nature of the campus climate and helping people understand, I hear all what you're saying, but how come I can't get a 2% pay increase? you know, right. this year. Well, um, the ideal would be that uh, what emerges from this are more financially savvy faculty yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, faculty that when sitting in academic senate and listening to the explanation for the 2% pay increase uh, can uh, think critically about what's being said to them. Mm -hmm. well, I'll agree, but I'm yeah. asking how do you measure that? I mean, it's the same thing. It's, it's no different from at the end of the course, you know, with our mm -hmm. seniors, how do I know that anybody's learned any economics mm -hmm. when they're graduating from this place? It's the same sort of structure, except that um, the difference is, is we have paying customers yeah. who, who, who are going through this educational process. Mm -hmm. We as an institution want to educate our our faculty, but it's not at all clear to me that our faculty and staff have any, have any particular desire to be educated about this. <laughs>
Well, I, I would say that four other campuses outside of the ACM have paid to and so we can yeah, look yeah, at that. Yeah, but the people who are paying are the, the presidents. Trainers. <laughs> not no, the, no, no, well. It looks like my mom and dad will say, sure. yes, you should take this course and go to Edward <laughs> Mark College. But, but well, these, these, these are people think. who have taken it. So those are registrations. So okay. the only thing I could do would be to look at, yes, if they buy a block of 150, take it, or 10, take it, then I would be able to do that. Yeah. And look at that over the long term. Of course, right now we have 12 surveys now. So we don't have, but we've got 40 some people registered in the system, some of which are ACM, and then some of which are several colleges um, throughout the Midwest. I can't decide if I want to be a cynic about this or an optimist about this, saying, yay, there's a tool out oh, there yeah. where me, the poor little faculty member, could finally understand the language and not feel like such an ignorant schlub when our CFO stands up and explains things or doesn't explain things to us, as the case may be. And the, and the cynic side of me says, that they want, they would, they would have an investment in teaching us this, so that we would know that we can't really say anything about that two percent. That's probably optimal. I You're really local don't know which way I want to be. <laughs> yeah. More informed is better, I think. I do. <laughs> agree. I am. I'm an educator. I absolutely think that. I absolutely believe that. I'm really curious to find out what our CFO will say when I tell him yeah. about this. I think our time is up. So, give them one more round of appreciation.